good morning everyone and uh, I'd like to extend a huge thank you to everyone for joining um, our Save British panel this morning. Um, I'm really delighted to be hosting such an illustrious panel um, and I really hope um, that this brings focus on the seriousness of the situation that British farming is confronting right now. Yesterday, uh, Jeremy Clarkson summed up his, his farming column by declaring that lots of farmers must be frightened by what they must do to survive. He also reminded the great British consumers that by taking the art and history and simplicity out of farming, we will end up with a lot of food that doesn't taste very nice. We are currently losing a farmer a week by them taking their own lives to suicide. British farming is facing an absolute perfect storm as we approach the end of the transition period and prepare to leave the single market. Back in September 2019, Sean Rickard, the ex-chief economist of the NFU, released a report called No Deal, the door to decimation of UK farming, which brought focus on what the Brexit shock means for UK farming. After many cry wolf no deals and in the midst of a devastating global pandemic, we are now facing an immovable cliff edge in nine weeks. The iceberg confronts us and it's clear that Boris Johnson omitted to mention that his oven ready deal included roasting British farmers. So this morning, I'd like to turn to Sean initially and ask him to give us his best summary of how he sees things mo moving forward with the possibility of no deal and a possibility of a deal and a possibility with a deal with America and also what it means for us moving our trading um, systems on, and entering WTO as uh, British members now and what impact that will have on our market moving forward. Okay, thanks Liz. Uh, good morning everyone. I shall try and be brief and uh, to the point. Um, Brexit no doubt meant different things to different um, people, but for agriculture, there were always two um, key uh, issues. That was the level of support and the trade policies post um, Brexit. In fairness, it was made clear prior to um, the referendum uh, that direct payments uh, would be um, phased out and replaced um, to some extent at least with payments for public goods. Having said that, uh, four years on, we still have absolutely no details. But my concern has always been um, that it was the trade environment which is much more threatening to the future of agriculture uh, than adjustments or reassignments to the level um, of um, support. Um, farm incomes, put it bluntly, are far more vulnerable to lower farm gate prices than they are to support payments. And lower farm gate prices are the consequences of the free trade agreements uh, that the government um, wishes to um, carry out um, post um, um, Brexit. Um, you, know, you may recall that uh, Theresa May's government said that uh, you know their intention was frictionless trade with the um, EU, and for all I know, she actually believed she could uh, deliver that. But that's been given up now. The government no longer make any pretense at uh, frictionless trade with the uh, Europe. Um, the, in a written statement, the government told the House of Lords committee uh, that um, they would accept uh, essentially a basic free trade agreement um, with the, the EU, pretty much like Canada, and that would be sufficient. And it would be very similar to the sort of free trade agreements they want to uh, conclude with the likes of the United States, Australia, New Zealand, and looking further ahead, you know, Brazil and um, Argentina. Now, I don't know what's going to happen um, at the end of this year, but whether there's a deal or no deal, um, what I'm certain about is that very quickly the government will return to the table and try to uh, secure a free trade deal with the EU. And let's be clear, a free trade deal with the EU just means we remove tariffs and probably um, any threat of quotas. We will still face non-tariff barriers. 
There will be the costs, therefore, of checks and delays. And the fear should be that these costs will be pushed down the chain um, onto farmers. Farmers will bear these extra costs of trade um, with the um, EU. But more seriously, agriculture is a long term business and we really should be thinking, you know, five years or more ahead. And the United States has made it abundantly clear over many years. No one can be in any doubt about this who knows anything about trade deals with America. But unless we are prepared to accept its standards when it comes to food, there will be no trade deal with uh, America. The government knows this. And it, that's why they can never agree to legislate to protect UK um, standards. If they were to do such a thing, uh, they would be ruling out the totemic um, trade deal with the United States. Um, so in my view, the pressure to um, get word in, into the agricultural bill um, to legislate against um, uh, lower standards from countries like America was never going to win because you're really asking the government um, to give up um, on what it claims are the benefits um, of um, Brexit. So what are the, would the consequences of a trade deal with the United States mean for British farmers? It would mean not only a lower farm gate prices and therefore lower farm incomes, it would also mean different standards here, which creates even greater problems for our trade with Europe, even more checks, even more controls, even more um, costs uh, going forward. So I leave you with this um, thought really. Um, the future for this industry is under threat. It is under threat from the sort of trade deals that the government seems determined to um, undertake with low cost agricultural producers. And yet we see absolutely nothing in a trade bill or in any, they talk of a food strategy policy, which is really a health or a nutrition policy. We have no food strategy, no strategy at all to help the industry withstand the um, more competitive, more harsh environment it's going to face in the coming years. I would go as far as to say that if you look carefully at the agricultural bill, you will read into it uh, and government preparing to shrink the agricultural industry and to focus on land management rather than food production. I would read into it that the government is preparing this country to import a lot more of its food in the future and to accept uh, that many farm businesses will not be with us in 10 years time. And I'll leave it at that. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for uh, reinforcing uh, the worst fears, Sean. As always, it's good to to um, hear the truth, and that's what we're really trying to get out um, in Save British Farming. We really want to try and get farmers prepared and the country prepared for what faces us. So, um, moving across to our um, panel, I just wonder if um, if Luke Pollard, if you've got any um, anything you'd like to comment um, on what Sean's just said to us. That's great. Thank you for that, Liz, and thank you, Sean, for for that assessment of where we are. I think we are at a crossroads with British farming at the moment. Uh, farmers are responding to not only the climate and ecological crisis of needing to decarbonise their production methods, but also to use the land that they are the stewards over to uh, reform uh, and uh, manage flood risk, uh, biodiversity gain and a whole host of other challenges at the same time. What the government seems to be wanting to overlay on top of that is a fundamental uh, uh, challenge to their economic foundation of allowing our farmers to be undercut in future trade deals. It's one of the reasons why um, pretty much all the speakers, uh, apart from the, uh, uh, the Secretary of State's cushion uh, who's on uh, here today, will probably say very similar things in the fact that actually we do need to preserve our farm uh, standards. We do need to make sure that future trade deals won't undercut them. We do need additional scrutiny uh, from Parliament uh, on any trade deals the government's signing. So at the moment, I think, you know, the, the, the kind of worst case scenario, but the expected case that I think Sean laid out there uh, could happen uh, without too much parliamentary scrutiny because the government has whipped its own MPs 
and there's more of them than there are all the other parties put together, uh, to deny Parliament a proper say in the scrutiny of trade deals. Now, that makes Westminster the only Parliament in the world that won't be having a say on a trade deal with Britain. Uh, and so if we're having a trade deal with the US, the US uh, Senate and Congress will have more say over that than Westminster will. And this doesn't sit right, especially for those people that are active in uh, farming and agriculture who want their elected representatives to stand up for them, to protect their business, to make a case for the high standards that we have. And you no, know, these high standards haven't just appeared by magic. There's been decades of improvement, decades of campaigning to get us to this point. And yes, there's of course more work to be done, but there's zero point us having high standards if the net effect of that is to export responsibility for our carbon, for our animal welfare, for our environmental protections to other countries that have lower standards, and in so doing, destroying the business models of our communities. Now, uh, the agriculture bill that, um, that Sean hinted at is ping-ponging between the Commons and the Lords at the moment. Uh, uh, the opposition parties, all of them, uh, are represented on the call today, uh, are supporting uh, amendments that have been tabled in the Lords to basically put our high standards into law, to not allow uh, them to be undercut and to have greater scrutiny of it. The key challenge and the, the voice we're missing from this debate is, you know, in theory, the Tories, they've claimed to be the party of the countryside for far too long. But on this one here, they're driving British farmers towards bankruptcy if they don't change tact when it comes to food standards. And this is a debate that is absolutely critical to what type of country we want to be after Brexit. Do we want to be a country of high standards, a beacon nation for others to follow, one that doesn't compromise on our values? Or are we going to be buffeted by whichever political persuasion is in power in foreign countries, allowing others to have a greater say than we do? Uh, and I, I really do worry about where we're going. And, you know, the final thing I just want to say here is that, you know, this fight is not yet over. We still have a vote uh, in the House of Commons on the 4th of November on the latest amendments in the Agriculture Bill. Labour MPs, as uh, doubtless the SNP, uh, uh, Plaid and the Lib Dems will be doing as well, will be voting to keep those standards high, to stand up for our farmers and to push it back to the Lords. But this ping pong can only last so long. And we need to put pressure on the government to make a meaningful compromise, to do something different. But as Sean has set out, doing so sets out a different way of, uh, sets out the truth about where Brexit approach. But by the time this vote happens, we all know ish the outcome of the US presidential election. And if there, there, is a, there is a different path that happens with a Biden presidency and a Trump presidency. But let's remember, that uh, the Democrats and Republicans share a common view of access to agricultural markets. And so there will not be an easy ride for Britain if we get a Biden presidency or a continuation of a Trump presidency. And our farmers, British farmers, need to know that despite being let down by many MPs that sit on government benches, there are parliamentarians of all different parties, of all different uh, uh, regional representations who are standing up for them, who are continuing to do that. So don't lose hope keep the pressure on that we have to do at the moment and I think the the, the challenge uh, I think to, to Sean and to all those people that want to save British farming is now is how do we focus attention how do we make sure that we are making the case in the most powerful way possible to change minds especially of those people close to uh, close to ministers and close to Downing Street to protect British farming to save our standards to make sure that we're not having a poorer animal welfare future with our farmers out of business in Britain. Thanks very much, Luke. That's very, uh, very uh, sobering. And uh, so I think that, you know, it has been a lot of publicity this weekend about America and, and the um, result of the election. And, and I suppose we should, you know, draw, you know, put focus on the fact that now there's one in eight chance of Trump winning, only one in eight chance. So we are facing the likelihood of a Biden presidency, which does move things a bit. So I will invite um, Tim Farron to give his comments on that and other matters. Thanks, Liz. Um, yes, I think you're going to hear some very similar thoughts from those of us from the various opposition parties here today. And you'll also hear some very similar thoughts from quite a number of Conservative backbenchers. And just to carry on a kind of message of hope, um, which is that I think that the amendment the Lords have selected to send back to the Commons um, uh, next week there's a, a the flavour of them, uh, the Korea amendment in particular, uh, much more likely to tempt uh, conservative rebels to support it. And so we'll 
we'll get the ask in here first, which is to everybody watching this first or second hand or whoever you have contacts with, uh, absolutely uh, retain hope. And remember the focus is on lobbying Conservative MPs, particularly backbenchers, particularly, particularly those in rural communities, that this is about making sure we underpin the livelihoods of our farmers across the country and indeed also about making sure that we maintain a British standards that we are incredibly proud of. I think the challenges that face British farming are, are several all at one uh, point. The opportunity with growing populations to feed more mouths should mean that farming is a, a booming business but one issue which precedes Brexit and I'm afraid will continue beyond it is an unfairness in the marketplace. Uh, a small number of colossal powerful retailers, uh, similar situation when it comes to processors, only that you've never heard of them, or the public mostly haven't, um, and then a very large number of relatively um, not powerful producers. Now, uh, the, the danger is, as we move through this situation uh, with uh, a new deal with the European Union, we hope, um, and deals then with other countries, is that we further weaken that um, position that UK farmers are in. And not only are they having to deal with being picked off by the big retailers, um, they also can be picked off from underneath by cheaper imports. And those imports are cheaper because poor quality leads to lower input costs, uh, as does the efficiencies of colossal ranch style farming. Um, and that is a major part of what makes um, British farming uh, a higher animal welfare standard, a higher environmental standard, higher standard all around than many of our international competitors, particularly in uh, North America. And it's simply this animal husbandry and the proportion of the, the ratio of animals to, to human beings on a farm is critical to there being high quality animal welfare. So it's not just that we have standards that are fixed in law and have been with our colleagues in the European Union and within the UK. It's also cultural. And so what happens, and habitual, it's something that we just do, the nature of family farming. I mean, up here in the Lake District, farms are huge, but they're not massive businesses, if you see what I mean. And so the ability to take care of one's livestock, but also take care of watercourses, maintain biodiversity, and do all those things that are hugely significant public goods, that, main, that is maintained also. And so being undercut by uh, cheaper imports, cheaper because they're poorly um, regulated and because of the lower environmental animal welfare standards, pushes the United Kingdom towards a totally different form of farming. It also pushes it towards a form of uh, farming where we're importing, as, as, as Luke has rightly said, but it also means that the likelihood of us seeing um, failed businesses, particularly over the seven years, as the basic payment scheme is being phased out before the environmental land management scheme is properly phased in, you could see much less production from UK farms and what production you see will take part, play place on much larger farms. That means much less attention to detail when it comes to animal welfare. It means much less attention to detail when it comes to environmental protection. It means much less attention to detail on all those things that we care about, such as biodiversity, access, uh, water management. And it also, if I can just be, um, uh, should be parochial for a moment, it completely kills the goose that lays the golden egg, which is the Lake District Yorkshire Dales tourism industry. Because the landscape that is in normal years worth more than three billion uh, pounds to our economy and is our biggest single employer by miles is maintained by our family farmers and so this is actually about the very culture the very heart the very nature of British farming we haven't made a choice in this country to decide to end family farming and all that goes with that and all the benefits of quality that goes with that but that is about that is what is about to happen if we make the wrong choice in the agriculture bill and the other decisions that the government uh, faces coming forward. So that's why these next few days are very, very important, but it's also why you should not give up hope. There are several dozen, dozen Conservative MPs in a real bind at the moment. We know what they should do. They've been told by the whip to do something else. The pressure from the farming community and everybody watching this, this call could be what literally saves British farming. 
Thank you, Tim. Thank you. Brilliant. And, uh, yes, I, I'll add to that. Um, having now done quite a few uh, chapter demos around the country, um, what I'm really feeling is this, and it, it almost brings tears to my eyes thinking about it, the love that we're getting from the British public and support is, is overwhelming and drives me on and, um, to, to keep doing this because there is a, a fear that you sort of think, well, should we just give up? And, but I, I think there is everything to fight for. I mean, this is our culture that we're fighting for. And um, so it's brilliant that you've all joined us today. Um, and uh, I, I am a, a Welsh immigrant living in England. So for that very reason, I, I want to put the focus on to the devolved nations who, uh, you know, the threat to the union is enormous. Um, and it breaks my heart literally uh, because I am I am from all different parts of the country <laughs> of the United Kingdom. Um, so I, and I think we've where do I start? Which which country do I go to first? Well, I, I think the one that's had the biggest threat is Northern Ireland um, and, and has had so much uh, put upon us. And we're facing the, the nightmare of, of a border between us and Northern Ireland. So I'm going to invite Paul for some comments. Thanks, Liz. Uh, the truth is that there's a lack of clarity about the future relationship of Northern Ireland, both with the Great Britain and also the EU markets. So that is a real problem. Uh, there's some things we know. Uh, the position in Northern Ireland has many similarities with those of Great Britain in terms of the challenges, but there's also some differences. First, to be clear, farm gate prices are lower than the cost of production, typically, for many items of produce. Uh, therefore, EU support payments are absolutely crucial to the sustainability of farms. Uh, Northern Ireland farms are typically smaller than those in Great Britain um, and Northern Ireland gets more than its population share in terms of support uh, payments from the EU. And so there's a lot of concern about the future around the nature of support payments from the British government and also what that means in terms of the trading relationship between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Uh, there was particular issues around Brexit and just to go beyond Northern Ireland, I'm, I have always been concerned about what Brexit Brexit means for the farming sector, because if you looked at one of the groups that were particularly vocal in arguing for Brexit, the Economist for Brexit group, they argued that one of the objectives of Brexit was to uh, source food on the international markets, to reduce food costs, and also to reduce the value of property to make home ownership more affordable. So those are core principles of a group of economists that have the ear of the government. Uh, so that has always been a concern for me. Um, we are also concerned about the internal market bill. And there's been a lot of publicity around the internal market bill in terms of it not accepting the EU protocol. But there's another really important element, which is the EU protocol isn't only about the border between both the Irish Republic and Great Britain and how you deal with it. It's also about the regulation that Northern Ireland will be under after the completion of the uh, in interim period. Um, the EU protocol makes clear that Northern Ireland will be part of the EU regulatory environment, but the Internal Market Bill says there will be a single regulatory environment for the UK and that Northern Ireland will not be able to introduce or adopt regulations that are not compliant with those of England, Scotland and Wales. Effectively, you will have the lowest common denominator in terms of regulation. So that if the Northern Ireland Assembly, uh, and I work for an MLA in the Northern Ireland Assembly, if the Northern Ireland Assembly wishes to protect animal welfare, if they wish to protect the interests of farmers, if they wish to uh, ensure that food quality is of a minimum standard, then they will be unable to do that probably in terms of the relationship with the other parts of the UK. But as with many things, the actual implication of the Internal Market Bill is not yet clear. Here we are a few weeks away from completely, completing the, the leaving of the EU, but we're not clear what the, the new terms of trade will be. So these things are a real concern to us. The other point that I would like to make is that one of the questions that was put up on uh, on here was, have we complained well about what the future holds? 
uh, and yes, our office has. We've put in a complaint to the Competition Markets Authority specifically about the need to protect the interests of farmers. And as Tim Farron said, about the fact that farmers are un in an unequal relationship with both the supermarkets and the food producers. There's exploitation. There are clear signs that during COVID-19 that food producers and supermarkets have further exploited their market domination to further exploit farmers. And the Competition and Markets Authority has surprise, surprise, basically said it is unable to deal with the matter. Uh, so we have real concern about the fact that there is a lack of regulatory protection for farmers and also for the food industry. We don't know what the situation in the future will be in terms of a lot of cross-border production. We don't know what the future will be in terms of the borders. We don't know what the internal market bill will actually mean for the farming and food sectors. So there is a real concern, but the expectation is that Northern Ireland farming will suffer disproportionately compared with the rest of the UK, and it will be in a very difficult position, Liz. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, yeah, moving, moving on to Scotland, <laughs> Deirdre, um, would you like to make some comments? Um, yes, yes, I would. Thanks very much, Liz. Um, and Luke and Tim and Paul have already made some very important points, I think, that I agree with, um, and particularly around keeping up the pressure on Conservative MPs. Um, I think Tim made that point. I think that is vital at this time um, because we know they are extremely concerned uh, about the reaction they're getting, um, particularly in rural areas. So um, that's that's very important. But I mean, some of the further challenges um, that we are facing that perhaps haven't yet been mentioned. I mean, the simplest, of course, we're losing access to the world's biggest market, easy access, uh, and and the most affluent. Um, and we're losing, as Sean mentions, in what is a very good report. Thank you, Sean, for that. Um, it's concise, it's succinct, and it's really hard hitting, but it makes all the points it needs to. It's, it's, uh, I, I, I really appreciate that report. But we lose that uh, financial support mechanism that the CAP brought, and the replacement being brought in by the UK government, as Sean says, will not be uh, in uh, supporting food production. So the upkeeping of a grouse moor um, is going to be more in tune with these proposals than food production. Now in Scotland, we will continue um, supporting farmers producing food just now, but another concern about the uh, internal market bill is that uh, the UK is taking control of state aid there, and that means that that is potentially under threat. Um, one of the reasons why the devolved authorities are so anxious about this bill. Um, PGIs um, are going, uh, or they will be going, they're negotiated in trade deals, of course, so the protections that Scotch beef and lamb have currently, that Orkney beef and lamb have, Shetland lamb, uh, several cheeses, some fish, Ayrshire tatties and uh, Scotch whiskey, they'll all be gone. Now, of course, um, a UK replacement was announced last week to some fanfare, but that will carry no weight domestically. Never mind overseas, and it's quite clear the UK government doesn't intend to help producers enforce that. Uh, there are no protections really within it, it's just a paper exercise. Uh, it depends on the EU to uh, protect those that are accepted before we leave, if we get a deal. Um, but any future ones would depend on getting the agreement into a trade deal, and they're probably going to be seen as barriers to trade. And I have a lot of concerns about the fact that <clears throat> it seems to involve trademarks. Uh, and EU certification marks, um, which aren't uh, as strong by any means as uh, the PGIs uh, under Europe. Um, for example, the EU certification mark can't be used to certify the geographical origin of goods and services. And, and we certainly know that trademarks are the preferred option of the US because they offer far less protection. Um, the, uh, the other thing that I would mention is the skeleton agreement with the Ukraine that happened recently. Um, now that appears to have given Ukrainian ministers the belief that the UK will be opened up to Ukraine's agricultural output. Uh, and of course we're expecting the same for other countries as the Brexit carnival rolls on. Standards dumped potentially to allow domestic markets to be flooded as, as Sean makes clear in his report. Uh, the other thing that the report references is, is this issue around marginal farms, um, our um, uh, farms being wiped out, and that particularly affects Scotland because a, a very high percentage of land in Scotland is Elfas. Um, but also the issue of, of the fact that, uh, and I think Tim touched on this, where the farms 
in remote areas are really what keep the communities around them viable. Um, so if we lose those farms, the potential is that we lose those communities and, and the generations of land knowledge that have been built up uh, around them. You know, as, as consumers, of course, we're used to a pretty sophisticated conversation with our food producers about standards in production and, and hygiene, animal welfare. But this government, frankly, just seems intent on dumbing down that conversation. We must continue to make sure that our voices are heard on this. Uh, and anything anyone can do who's listening to this to get in touch with those MPs, particularly Conservative MPs, and make their views clear on this is really important at this stage. Um, November the 4th is when those amendments come back. Uh, please get in touch with your MPs now. <laughs> Thank you, Deirdre. Um, and yeah, I'll move, move on to Ben Lake in Wales. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Sorry, I only put you last because I'm Welsh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Yoch. And um, perhaps unsurprisingly, I'm, uh, well, I won't echo a lot of the, the comments that have already been made because I agree with them and I know we have uh, other questions to cover in the ensuing discussion. But I will add, perhaps as, as a way of an opening remark, that uh, something that has been quite missing in certainly the counter debates in, in the House of Commons uh, regarding the Agriculture Bill and then the debates again on the amendments from the House of Lords has been the value um, that British agriculture and, uh, brings uh, to the country, not just in terms of uh, the output and the produce itself, of course that has value and, and it's important, but um, a wider sense and definition of, of value. I'm thinking now of some of the social, cultural, uh, the economic uh, benefits that agriculture brings to the areas uh, in which it is established. And from uh, speaking uh, as, a, as a Welshman um, and having been brought up in a, in a rural area, I know that uh, the cultural um, importance of farming is quite uh, significant in Wales. When you consider that 43% of, of Welsh farmers speak Welsh, that is um, far greater proportion than the uh, equivalent for the population as a whole. Um, you know, you lose Welsh farming and the Welsh language, something that is priceless, um, is also then under threat. Um, but then just moving on just from the language, you know, you, you consider some of these areas, Cerdigion uh, being my own constituency, and farming is very much at the backbone of the economy. Now, in terms of the number of people that it employs, yes, it's an important contributor, but also the uh, economic activity that it sustains. Um, you know, if you think of uh, some of the farms in my constituency, they will also have perhaps bed and breakfast or tourism units. It's a very important part of the tourism office offer for a rural area. It also then makes sure that a lot of the foundational economy uh, businesses are, are able to have custom throughout the year. I think, um, Many of my farmers um, remind me quite uh, often that as soon as the um, single farm payment comes into their bank accounts, it's out again because they've already spent it in local businesses. And, you know, it doesn't surprise me then that some of the research suggests that if every pound spent um, on Welsh farming, it, it, it's equivalent to seven pounds uh, for the local economy. And then if we just consider those sort of aspects with the reality that in terms of economic development, Rural areas are often those that are, I think we could all agree, uh, left behind in, in certain ways. Um, it's not always uh, the case that grand schemes of economic development really take into account um, the importance of rural communities. And so if you then have a situation whereby one of the key industries, the key pillars of the rural economy is undermined or worst case scenario, completely devastated. The prospects for the whole range of economic activity, the whole range of social activity in vast tracts of the UK is in doubt. Um, and that is something that I think has been missing in, in some of the debates, uh, quite understandably, because we've got plenty to argue about. Um, but it's something that should be, it's worth reminding. Um, you know, it, we are talking here about something that is quite integral to the way of life um, of, of so many communities uh, across uh, the UK and especially in Wales. Um, can I just before uh, we, we move on uh, to the discussions and I and I um, shut up for a moment I think one of the counter arguments that we've had um, from those who oppose some of the amendments that um, I think we all support on this panel uh, from the Lords has been that there are other ways of, of perhaps safeguarding um, farming standards in the UK, that there's a way, other ways of preventing the undercutting of, of um, UK agriculture. Um, one of the, 
in my opinion, weak arguments is that of labelling. Now, I, I think we'd all agree that labelling is important and we want to make sure that labelling is transparent, that it's robust and that there is a, you know, real uh, value in a labelling system. But that's really only going to apply to, to those produce that are sold in supermarkets or on, in retail. And as we've seen in COVID-19, um, the importance of the food service sector for, for UK farming is quite significant. And I can't see how labelling um, really addresses that potential um, output for, for imports of, of uh, lower st production standards. And so the, the threat of the UK industry being an, undercut by imports um, from you know, lower production standards um, is still quite, quite big um, if we don't uh, address uh, the issue of the food services industry. Now, of course, you can avoid all that headache by making sure that those imports don't come in in the first place. I appreciate that. But if we get to a point where um, we've not won the argument, then that is going to be the next battleground. Yes, well, that's timely because uh, the chair of uh, the Red Tractor um, company uh, actually is, has agreed to stand down having um, uh, it revealed by Farmers Weekly last week that she voted against upholding British standards, which uh, which is pretty shocking, really, um, and undermines you know us as far me as always a farmer um, trust in 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 that system, um, and it sort of moves timely on to a question for um, Sean and panelists from Phil Case from the um, Farmers Weekly. He asks. The government has committed to fund UK agriculture to the same levels for the life of this parliament. George Eustace previously promised farmers the government will be able to fund the industry to at least the same levels going forward. Realistically, in the post-Brexit Covid era, will the government be able to afford to continue to fund farming to the same level with pressures on the NHS, education, security, etc.? Do you want me to go first, Liz? Yes, go on, please. <laughs> well, just a couple of quick points. Of course, the government are committed to maintaining funding during this parliament, but they haven't provided any details and presumably um, all manner of areas such as flood defences and rewilding will be able to attract uh, funding and something else, which I don't think is appreciated. Um, there'll almost certainly be large scale redistribution of that support and probably towards larger scale estates at the expense of smaller farms. But, you know, looking ahead, of course, um, the public finances um, are now in a terrible um, state. Um, the government, um, we've got no idea how they intend to um, um, improve them going forward, how much will depend on austerity and cutting expenditure and how much um, on taxing. But I would point people who are looking for clues, um, I'd remind them to something uh, uh, Paul said a few minutes ago, the uh, economists for free trade, not one of them's a free trader incidentally, but leave that on one side. The economists for free trade who were advising the um, uh, Brexiteers um, said, in their um, report to them, that agriculture would be decimated. <laughs> they had no, they had no qualms about what they um, were up to. As far as they are concerned, um, agriculture is an industry that can be sacrificed um, for a Brexit. And does anyone really think that's going to change once um, you know we're into trade deals with America, Brazil, Argentina, and Australia? Um, I. I I just can't see it really, um, unless um, there is the sort of groundswell generally um, that we are seeing over um, um, school dinners. But that would really have to amount to people forcing the government to backtrack on its albeit empty promises for Brexit. Thank you, Sean. Um, so we haven't heard from Daniel yet. I don't know if you're still there, Daniel? Daniel Zeitner? Daniel said he had to nip off for a while, so oh, okay. um, he'll be back, I think. Okay, all right. Um, has anyone uh, does anyone else got anything that they'd like to um, contribute to Phil's question from Farmers Weekly? Tim? Well, quickly, I think it's a really important observation. First of all, the government has committed to the three and a bit billion, um, but the thing to remember is, uh, whether we liked it or not, the thing about cap spending in the UK was very much ring-fenced to the things that it had to be spent on. And 
uh, there's nothing to say that the UK government couldn't decide to spend some of that three and a bit billion on things that are outside the current brief. Now, they might be very good things, by the way, but there wouldn't be support directly for agriculture. The same thing is, and I think it's something I touched upon briefly, a part of this perfect storm is the fact that the cheque that farmers get for basic payment in December will be the last full one. And that from January, um, farmers will be losing between five and 25% um, this coming year of uh, basic payments. And you know, if you're a livestock farmer uh, in England, basic payments makes up 85% on average of your income. And that's massive. And for that to be peeled away, albeit, I think everybody on this call probably agrees that basic payment isn't the right way of doing things long term. And actually, in principle, the new Elms Environmental Land Management Scheme is a good thing in theory and paying uh, public money for public goods is absolutely a good thing. But the scheme, even the government doesn't promise that scheme will be fully available for seven years. This is a seven year period alongside all the other things we've been talking about to do with the markets, trade, imports and standards where loads of farmers are going to think, blimey, I've got seven years to quit. Um, and I think that's the real problem that now, so, so basically the government needs to commit to more than 3 million, in my view, and I think the view of probably a number of people on this call as well, because um, my, other, my other hat is I chair the all party group on hill farming. And, and our position has always been for a few million extra quid, not many, probably, you know, five, 10 million a year, you can maintain BPS at its current levels until Elms is available to everyone. And then you don't lose a whole bunch of family farms by mistake during the seven year transition. Thank you, Tim. Um, okay, I've got a question from Abby uh, Kay from Farmers Guardian. Um, what are the panelists doing to put pressure on the food service sector not to accept lower standard food? We've had welcome commitments from several retailers, but out of home eating, uh, oh, I can't read it, oh, wait, hang on. Um, but out of home eating is probably going to be the real problem area, Abby Kay. Um, so I, um, I think, again, this is an interesting question, especially when you think about Red Tractor and its, its roots back to Tesco, um, because I think giving lots of promises about what they're going to, how they're going to um, fill their supermarket shelves and where from where, um, you know, when those shelves are empty, they're going to, they're not going to turn around and say, oh, I'm not going to have that Brazilian beef, I think, but, um, and I can see Daniel's back now, so I'm going to ask him because he hasn't commented yet. I'm afraid, Liz, I was, I'm only just back, so you'll have to repeat the question, I'm afraid. And you'll have to unmute first. <laughs> Technophobe, as my son was saying. Um, what are the panellists doing to put pressure on the food service sector not to accept lower standard food? We've had welcome commitment from several retailers. Um, but out, um, but out of home eating is probably out of it all. Home eating is probably going to be the real problem area. Um, but I mean, I, I would go back on that because I mean, we've had commitments from supermarkets to say no, we won't, won't give them, you know, we won't provide that horrible food. But you know, when the supermarket shelves are empty, my feeling is that you know supermarkets are not going to suddenly, you know, say we're not going to give you that chicken when there's no other chicken available. Um, but I'd be interested to hear your comments on that. Well, my sense on that is, I mean, we're seeing a, a price war between the supermarkets at the moment. And I mean, obviously, the supermarkets have said some quite welcome things up to now. But I don't think one can necessarily guarantee that for the future. And I think I'd go right back to, um, to Sean's point earlier in the conversation. I mean, the margins up, up and down the food chain are pretty tight and the supermarkets have the power. So in the end, um, they will do what they will do, but I think the people who are gonna miss out are gonna be the people at the bottom, almost inevitably, who are the primary producers. So I'm afraid, I don't think we can look to the supermarkets for any salvation in terms um, of pressure on costs for farmers. So sadly, I don't see that as a solution. 
Thank you. Um, has any, would anyone else like to make a comment on these, any of these issues? Please raise your hands. If anyone else wants to ask a question, either uh, put your little red hand up or put something in the chat box um, as we move, move forward. Um, I've got a question here from James Woodward. Uh, the UK-Japan FTA has been signed. Um, Department of Trade, we're touting this as a test run for parliamentary scrutiny, etc. Can MPs on the panel explain how that has gone? And there's another question. Secondly, the Trade and Agricultural Commission have been on some sort of regional webinar roadshow to engage with people across the UK. What has been the purpose of this? And what levels and types of engagement have they carried out? James Woodward from Sustain. Um, and I will take that question to Deirdre. Um, with the, oh, sorry. Ah, oh, great, thank you. Um, the UK-Japanese uh, Free Trade Agreement signed. I mean, yes, it's, uh, it sounds, of course, uh, positive, but we're not expecting anything like the difficulties with uh, food production standards from Japan that we are with the US, of course. And these, uh, this is where a, a lot of the concerns are focused at the moment, um, what, and, and, and other countries as well. Um, but uh, food, uh, as I understand it, is not a large part of that agreement. Um, there are also concerns around PGIs there as well, because although a very few have been established, um, there is something like uh, 70 PGIs, which are, are to be left to a later date to be inserted into uh, the trade deal. So we have no certainty around that uh, either. Um, I mean, in fact, if I can just return to a previous question and, and, and about that lack of certainty um, uh, on funding too. I mean, there is this lack of detail, this, this, this lack of certainty is just so difficult for farmers and crofters and for the devolved authorities. Um, and it, part of it is the sort of secretive nature of this government in, in relation to funding pots. Now, I, I wanted to bring up particularly, because it hasn't come up yet, the, the Shared Prosperity Fund and the replacement for EU structural funding. What is going to be the replacement for that? We have been promised details for years and we have had nothing. Those funds are incredibly important for our rural areas, for our coastal communities, and as of yet, um, there is, is, is nothing there. We keep being told that at some future spending review, we'll be given those details and we haven't been. But yeah, I mean, so UK, Japan, FTA, I mean, you know, on, on the face of it, uh, it's, it's a skeleton agreement. I mean, hopefully it will be, it will, it will work out well. But um, as I say, just as an example, the PGIs being given so little detail is, is a real concern. Okay, thank you. And Daniel, would you, have you got something to add to that? I see you've made a comment. You're in yeah, sorry, just unmuting. Yeah, uh, yeah just on, on the Trade and Agriculture Commission. I mean, I, I was on one of the regional calls last week to my surprise. Um, and although it's Chatham House, I can't say very much about it. What I would say is that from the beginning, I felt that this commission was a fig leaf, frankly. Um, and there was nothing on that regional call which made me think um, any different to that. It was, the attendance was light, let me say, and I would say also highly unrepresentative. So, you know, I, I applaud them for making the attempt, but it, it didn't feel like any, anything substantial. And so I, I think it's a fig leaf. Yes, I, I like to call it a pacifier. It's, I think it's just been there to keep keep us farmers quiet. Um, I, I'm not quite sure how you get to a consensus with the with, with the um, people that sit on the panel. I mean, Shankar Singh, I'm one of them. Uh, you know, uh, you know, I've sat as a parish councillor, and it's hard to get to a decision on it when you live in the same village as people. But God knows what that would be like. Um, Sean, have you got something you'd like to say about the commission? <laughs> You need to unmute. I know. I'm, I wasn't expecting you to come back to me. And you well know, Liz, you're trying to wind me up here, uh, that Mr. Gove is running circles around the agricultural industry. What would his Henry Dimble be and his commission and all the rest? They're all designed, really, to divert your attention and make you turn away, as it were, while they push through uh, this agricultural bill. Um, none, if they were genuine if they were genuine about protecting your standards, they'd have had no qualms about putting it in the agricultural bill. And I've explained why they can't do that and why they won't do it. And um, in my opinion, 
um, to hold out any hope that they'll change their minds between now and next week, next month, um, is uh, a forlorn hope. Um, that ship has sailed. Yes. Um, well, we'll keep on with some tractor demos and get some attention. Um, so I've got a question from uh, the independent John Stone. Apart from the longer term effects of worse terms of trade, what immediate effects would there be on farmers in the event of a WTO exit on the 31st of December? For example, is there any time sensitive produce of risk of spoilage as in the fishing sector or anything worth considering? Sure, that probably goes to you first. Can I, can I have a go at that briefly? One of the reasons why I find it very difficult that anyone um, who has um, an ounce of humanity, uh, let alone common sense, um, would consider um, a no deal um, agreement is that there would be significant increases in many um, food prices at a time, of course, when um, many communities are going to be reeling from the effects of um, a COVID um, recession. Um, and it just strikes me as um, complete madness. But I would like to bring people's attention because, um, you know, I hear farmers sometimes say, oh, higher prices. Um, oh, that would be all right for me, will it? Just think what would happen if tariffs um, were applied to sheep exports to Europe. I think that would more or less kill the trade. And then what would happen to the sheep that would have been exported? They would have to be turned back on the domestic market. <laughs> What's going to happen to the prices on the domestic market? Not only are the sheep farmers going to lose uh, markets probably over the longer term in Europe, um, they would suffer lower prices here as all this extra produce that isn't exported is dumped back on the uh, domestic market. Um, the question asks about spoilage in the... Um, event of uh, delays, there may very well be for some horticultural um, products, um, et cetera. Um, um, but, and just bear in mind that those sort of delays will exist whether there's a deal or a no deal because they're the sort of things that are subject to non-tariff barriers. But I imagine the people who are importing um, such produce um, will start to um, find ways to get around some of the problems and deal with them. So I'm not worried about that in the long run. Of course, there could be chaos for a month or something with lorries in, piled up around the country. Um, I'm looking longer term, really. I, I, my whole thrust here is what is going to happen to the industry over the longer term. Agriculture is a long term industry and it needs planning, it needs guidance and it needs a degree of certainty, none of which it's getting at all at the moment. Thank you, Sean. Well, I've got Luke offering up his, he's a fishing nerd, apparently, fisheries nerd. Thanks, Liz. And, and yes, I am. I'm, it's the joys of when you represent a, a constituency like Plymouth that has a thousand jobs in fishing. Uh, it, it kind of uh, uh, takes on uh, very much an important part of your life. Um, if we don't have seamless um, movement over borders, we will see uh, real consequences for the uh, for fishing in particular. And fishing is a good example of needing to export uh, good quality, uh, fresh produce quickly. Any delay, any any additional customs checks, non-tariff barriers, delays at borders is going to decrease the value of the products that we export. And we are very good at exporting our fish we, we, uh, and seafood products. We, we export two thirds of what we catch at the moment. And it's that same principle though, that can be applied to farming. Although keeping um, agricultural produce uh, out is has a, a different effect than if you keep some fish out over on the counter overnight um, it still means we need to access uh, our markets swiftly and easily without delay what we're already seeing though is farmers trying to de-risk uh, their production for the first part of next year we're seeing uh, fewer farmers uh, looking at sheep as an, as an area of income for the next year for instance because of the risk that is now being carried with those animals so we are seeing the market reshape immediately and it is the uncertainty about this ministers will give people a you know a few weeks notice if that to say what the trading relationship will be with our largest agricultural market uh, next year but if you are a farmer, if you are a fisher, then you do need a long term uh, model about how you do it. There will be products, there'll be animals in fields that will be ready to be exported next year. There'll be crops in the ground ready to be exported. But the additional challenge that we haven't mentioned so far is 
Brexit also produces impacts on the agricultural labour supply. So we've seen crops rotting in our field over the past two years because there haven't been sufficient number of agricultural workers. Thankfully, some of the worst effects that were, were predicted had been challenged and were addressed in part this year. But that's still a big risk next year that we'll see crops rotting in the ground and not enough trained agricultural workers being able to do that. So this future is very uncertain for what's coming and that will have an impact on business investment and on, 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 on farmers in particular looking at the redundancy payment option that the legislation includes to say, well, do I take that now or do I uh, hold on? And there will be farmers, sadly, choosing the redundancy payment option early on, I think, exiting the market and then helping achieve the government's objectives, I think, of importing more food from abroad in the future, uh, which is not what we need to sustain British agriculture. Thank you. Um, Rikia, I've got another question here, um, and it's from uh, Henrietta Engberson. Sorry about my pronunciation there. Uh, might I ask, if the government decides lowering the food standards and the UK has a free trade agreement, if the US with, sorry, sorry, I'm going back again. If the government decides lowering the food standards and the UK has a free trade agreement, if with the US, I think it must mean, what could be the first product being imported with lower food standard? Would it be beef or chicken or something else? And as a consequence, how many farmers would be under threat? <laughs> um, well, Sean, that's one for you probably. You're on mute again. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, I'm struggling to unmute myself while I'm thinking about the question. It's uh, it's, it's impossible, really, isn't it? Almost certainly it would be, uh, I suppose, in the livestock sector. It would take a little bit of time. If I can, you know, we've been down on the uh, farming industry very, um, uh, probably we ought to just make something very clear. I think um, the chances now of a United States trade deal have been pushed somewhere into the future. Um, we have a couple of years perhaps before um, uh, we have to really worry about uh, um, this uh, threat and that gives you more time to pressurize the government. Of course, the Americans want to get beef in here. Of course, they want to get um, um, their um, poultry and indeed um, pork in here. And they wouldn't come necessarily as animals, they would come as um, livestock um, products, etc. And, um, you know, we focus like mad on things like chlorinated chicken, etc. As a general rule, America is a lot cheaper when it comes to producing these things than we are. And um, even if we did do some deal to stop chlorinated chicken coming in for five years or something, there would be plenty other chickens and beef coming along uh, the same uh, route. So um, very difficult to say um, exactly what would happen, but the livestock sector must be in the firing line. Line, but right behind it is coming cheap cereals. Thank you. Um, ben, did you ha have you got anything you'd like to answer to that question or anything else that's gone before? Just, I, I think I don't have that much to add other than what Sean uh, just said. I, I think um, the both uh, the Republicans and the uh, Democrats have made it quite clear in Congress that you know they, they want to have access to the agricultural market. However, also if there isn't a um, uh, a Brexit agreement that uh, respects the Northern Ireland Protocol and the um, Good Friday Agreement, it doesn't look as though either a Republican presidency or a Dem Democratic um, or Democrat pr uh, presidency uh, will entertain a, 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 a trade deal with the UK until that is resolved. I, I think that's been made quite clear. So I would agree that it's probably a problem. Uh, that's been pushed down a few years um, and you know I think that in within the American system both the Cattlemen's Association and the poultry sector are very very uh, vociferous lobbyists of their political representatives so I think they both might have a, um, a big say in trying to get uh, access to the UK market. I think I see Tim has got his finger up and I think he's probably going to have a, a better answer. To no I'm not, <laughs> not no I'm, I'm just uh, slightly curtailed by having to go off to do another thing in my patch um, so I'll get my last to Penneth in before I, if I leave you and say thank you to everybody. Um, one thing I think is just worth bearing in mind is that um, the reality is, that I guess, what, whatever our view has been about whether leaving the EU is a good or a bad idea, the debate as a whole has been very, very emotional and not very practical. And that's everybody's fault, okay? Not pinning the blame on anyone in particular. And the problem is here, we're now looking at the practicalities 
and these things are being unpicked in a matter of days and weeks and it's trying to take the public with us and the danger is here that when you start talking about brexit and no deal and deal you immediately flush people into their brexit trenches um and they start pointing the finger at one another and it, the really important thing here is we have a sober understanding about what is being asked of us as parliamentarians and indeed being put to the, to the country um so i say we should be practical but actually it is emotional because we are potentially seeing some decisions taken that look fairly incidental and not that interesting to a lot of people out there that will change the nature of British farming uh, massively. And, and, and I'm bound to think about you know, our sort of area, Ben's area, many other people's as well, where the landscape could physically change within a decade. And the nature of hospitality and tourism change in a decade, heritage change uh, and be gone for, for good. The style of farming that we adopt in this country, which is by its instinctive cultural nature, uh, high quality in its animal welfare standards. This is not saying America is a terrible, terrible place where they do awful, awful things, but the standard of farming, just objectively, animal welfare and environmental standards, much lower. Of course, most of us on this call will be delighted if Biden wins in a week or so's time. And let's not pretend the Democrats are any more um, uh, friendly towards us in terms of these sorts of issues. They weren't when TTIP was being drawn up a few years ago. Let's not pretend this is some kind of great achievement for us. It'll be better for the world, better for America if, if Biden wins. It'll make it a little bit harder than it was already to get a, a decent outcome for British farmers. And we've got 90% of our uh, sheep exports from Cumbria going into the EU. So whether for good or for ill, getting that deal is the critical thing. That's the damage limitation that really needs to happen. But the long-term consequences of a deal with the states or indeed any other large um, uh, uh, trader, uh, trading block that um, where there isn't those minimum standards is colossal. It could change everything. It's not just about cheaper prices in the supermarkets, it's about the whole nature of farming across these islands, which is why, you know, don't give up basically. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Yes, I'm, I, I lived through Thatcher's uh, decimation of the mining industry in the 1980s in South Wales and, uh, yeah, I am very much reminded of that. But there was lots of things about mining which were very, um, we were glad to get rid of. <laughs> um, but with, with farming and beautiful countryside and, and our great standards, it just breaks my heart to think that we're doing this. Um, and uh, so we will keep fighting and keep going forward. Um, and uh, so I'd like to extend again huge thanks to everyone for joining us um if anyone wants to uh, say a, a, fair, a, fair, a farewell before you go i don't know if you have to nip off um but any of the panelists can i invite you to summarize in any way luke's putting his hand up yeah i just say thank you for your work in 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 raising these issues uh, what we need people to realize is that although there is a real genuine risk to british farming and uh, by extension to the food we eat there are opportunities out there for us to stop that damage being caused in the first place. What we do need to make sure is that in a, we use every single day between now, the agriculture bill coming back, and then the trade bill that we haven't spoken about that will follow the agriculture bill to make sure that we're putting a positive case forward in support of our farmers, in support of our high standards, in support of the type of uh, agriculture we want to have in our country and there is opportunities for us to do that and I know from the cross-party working that's been taking place between uh, the Labour Party uh, that I lead on in this area, uh, the SNP, uh, uh, the Lib Dems and Pride and others, is that we can continue to make that positive case. This is not only about telling the government where they're getting it wrong, although they are, and we will say that, we will also continue to make the case for a positive stand for our farmers as well, because they are not a passive victim in this. They need to be part of the fight, part of making the case, not only in webinars like this, but in your local paper, in, 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 in local media, in terms of down the pub, whatever it may be, making the case that she says, this matters. This is how we earn our crust. This is our identity as rural communities. And we're not simply going to let it go easily. We are going to make a fight for it. And if we have that determination, whether we win every battle along the way, that's a different matter. And I hope we do, but there's some big challenges. We need to make that positive case for British agriculture. I think that is all, you know, what I hear from, you know, Although myself, Deirdre and Tim and uh, probably disagree on a great many things of joys of politics. On this one here, we are all aligned. We are all positive about what's going on. And there are Tory MPs that need that encouragement, that little bit of extra help. 
the utter nonsense with the free school uh, meals vote last week has, uh, mm. I think, shaken a lot of Tories confidence in Downing Street. Let's make sure we're using that opportunity to make them stand up for their rural communities, as well as standing up for hungry children. There is opportunities uh, to make the case for British agriculture. And certainly, um, uh, I know everyone on the call will continue to be doing that. Thank you, Luke. Yes, we've got another chat to Emma on Friday. Where I'm being, being um, propelled to do another one in Malmesbury in Wiltshire, so that'll be the next one, and um, possibly in London next week. So, um, anyone else would like to say something? Paul Gosling. Thanks. I can't hear you. You've muted. Sorry, I thought it had unmuted and muted itself. Uh, thank you very much, Liz, for, for arranging this and for, invi for inviting us. I mean, a couple of points I would like to stress is that we are just weeks away from fundamental changes in Northern Ireland's relationship with both Great Britain and the European Union, and we don't know what that future relationship is going to be. We also don't know what, in practice, the Internal Market Bill will mean for us in terms of our ability to regulate our trading environment in Northern Ireland. So this is really very irritating. But in addition to which, Northern Ireland is much more dependent on support payments than the rest of the UK. Proportionately, Northern Ireland farmers get more than their population share of support payments. So they are very dependent on them. And we don't know what the long-term implications are in terms of support payments. And the final point is, the obvious one from if you're in Northern Ireland, which is that the farming and food sector is much, much, much more important to the Northern Ireland economy than it is for any other part of the UK. And actually, if the economy in terms of farming and foodstuffs is badly damaged, then the whole of the economy of Northern Ireland is badly damaged. And there's just so much uncertainty that it is really very frustrating. Thank you. Um, Deirdre? Yes, yes, just quickly. And um, firstly, once again, congratulations, Sean, on a really excellent report. I think I would urge everyone to read it. Um, I think it, it, it is so um, clear cut uh, in, in the arguments it presents. Um, but really, just uh, congratulations to Save British Farming for the work you're doing. A remarkable job in informing the public of the really big issues that underlie this, this debate. Um, I, I want us to, to just make sure that everyone knows we need to keep making the argument for our excellent food and drink sectors uh, and our agricultural communities. Keep unpicking those complexities around trade deals and the implications they have for our, our communities. I think that's really important. They are complex. They are hard to, to, to pull apart and, and, and be able to see as a result what it's going to mean for you as a farmer or someone in the food production sector. But it's, that's our job. Um, but it, it's everyone's job to, 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 keep, um, to, to keep reviewing those. Um, and, and just around the internal market bill, I think Paul just mentioned it, but I mean, the genuine fear devolved authorities have that their powers to determine the needs of their communities, um, and in this in instance, of course, rural communities, uh, according to local needs and conditions, are going to be really severely, severely undermined by this bill. Um, this is something that we are going to be keeping an extremely close eye on and challenging at every point. Thank you. Um, and I'll ask Daniel to, to close up and Ben and, uh, and then we'll leave for Sean. So three more and then I know we've run over, but um, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Well Th thanks very much, Liz. I'll just be very brief. Just thank you to you and to Mike for all the work that you're doing with Save British Farming. Um, I think you know it's, it's absolutely clear that people need to step up. This is a key time, exactly as Luke has said. The pressure is making a difference. It will be the pressure that's put on, on Conservative backbenchers in the nicest possible way. But please keep up the effort. And I, I'm an eternal optimist. I do think there's a future, particularly for family farming in the UK, but it will only happen if we put the pressure on. And now's a key time. Thank you, Daniel. Yes, we'll keep fighting. Ben. Thank you, Liz. Uh, just to echo um, what the others have said in terms of thanking you and Mike and, and Sean and all at Save British Farming for arranging this panel. Um, and also just to, to make clear that I'm sure that all of the MPs on the panel certainly will have received a pile of correspondence from constituents who are very, very concerned about maintaining um, uh, food standards, production standards in the UK, as well as supporting their local uh, farmers. And so that, I take quite a lot of heart from that, uh, from the hundreds of messages that we have received. And um, I would echo Daniel in saying that I am quite optimistic that on the 4th of November, all of that um, support 
for uh, UK farming uh, will be transpired and, and will transfer over to convincing a few extra of our Conservative colleagues to, to, to vote for the amendments on the fourth. So I think um, on that note, uh, just do have our. John, would you like to close up? <laughs> I wasn't going to say anything. Um, obviously, I'm just overwhelmed with your enthusiasm, Liz, and uh, your hard work. I don't know how you uh, keep going, really. I wish you the best of luck, and uh, if there's any justice in this world, uh, you will be successful. Well, thanks to everyone. Thanks for the time you've given up. Sorry we've run over a bit. And um, let's hope we can get together again and see and reevaluate what things are like in the next few weeks. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye-bye.